Okay, Brother Jim, I'll put this to the side here. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the final night of our missions conference. We're so glad to have you here. Uh, for those of you waiting live stream going, what's going on? Uh, listen, we had an international dinner, and it just takes time to eat that much food. And it's just, I mean, just some things take time. And so it did, but we're glad to have each and every one of you here tonight. What a wonderful conference it's going to be. It has been, but it's not over yet. And Amen. so we're having one. And you know, I think this is good. You know, uh, Dave, this is an orchestra recruitment tool. I know if I, if, I, if I kept this going another week, you'd have a 20 piece orchestra. It'd be very, very interesting. And so anyway, glad to see all the, all the extra people that are in. So Brother Jim is gonna lead us in a song, number 431, Brother Jim. All right, let's stand together. 431, saved, saved. Now sing it like you're saved. Ready? I found a friend who is all to me. His love is ever true. I love to tell how he lifted me and what he for you save by the power divine save to the life sublime life now is sweet and my joy is for I'm saved 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 he saves me from every sin and harm secures my soul each day. I'm leaning strong on his mighty arm. I know he'll guide me all the way. Saved by his life divine, saved in the life sublime. Life now is sweet and my joy is complete for I'm saved, saved, saved. When poor and needy and all alone in love he said to me, come unto me and I'll lead you. To live with me eternally, saved by his power divine, saved to new life sublime. Life now is sweet and my joy is come, for I'm saved, saved, saved. Amen. Wonderful singing. Good to have each and every one of you here. Elry, I was so glad to meet you at dinner time tonight. Glad to have you here, uh, in, here in the Pendleton neighborhood. And uh, Jean, I see you came all the way down to Athena. What did Darren do? Tell you the meal was at seven. What's going on here? And uh, anyway, glad to have you here tonight and just glad to see uh, all of you. And then uh, Savannah came in late last night. Didn't get to say hello, but glad to have you here. You know, you guys look cramped there. It's like they're riding coach here. But uh, anyway, they're doing okay. None of them have poked another one in the eye with a bow or anything. So uh, they've actually got it right. I'm glad for that. And let's have a word of prayer. And we're going to ask God's blessing on the service tonight. Before I do, let me read one greeting here. Dear Pastor Mark Watkins and Brian Baptist Church, greetings from snowy northern Japan. We are praying for you all and hope you have a blessed missions conference. We here continue on serving the Lord, trying to make a difference. We are so grateful for you and our other supporting churches. Without prayer and financial support, we simply would not be able to remain here and share the gospel. God bless and take care, Alan, Minx, and family. So let's have a word of prayer. Ask God's blessing on the service. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray 
uh, that you would do a special work in our hearts tonight. It has been an amazing week, and uh, you have spoken to us through your word. You have drawn us, you have turned us, you have convicted us. And uh, yet, Lord, the mission, the, the mission is not over, the message is not over. And so I pray that tonight would be a night where we would have open hearts to sense and seek and heed your bidding, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. our hymn books one more time to 107 and sing so little time 107 okay let's let's stand as we sing this one 107 on the first now so little time the harvest will be over our reaping done, we're reapers taken home. Report of work to Jesus, Lord of harvest, and hope he'll smile and that he'll say, Well done. May we reap or miss our golden harvest today. 
more souls to win Oh, than to save dear ones from the burning They will go to bring some sinner in How many times I should have strongly pleaded How often did I fail to strictly warn The Spirit moved Oh, had I pled for Jesus His fallen lost ones now reborn Today we rape Or miss our golden harvest Today is given us souls to win Oh, then to save Some dear ones from the burning Today we'll go to bring some sinner in. Despite the heat, the ceaseless toil, the hardship, the broken heart, or those we cannot win, misunderstood because we're often peculiar, still no regrets we'll have but for our sin. Today we reap or miss our golden harvest. Today is given us souls to win. Oh, then to save some dear ones from the burning. Today we'll go to bring some sinner in. A day of pleasure or a feast of friendship, a house or car or garments fair or fame, will all be trash when souls are brought to heaven. And then how sad to face the slacker's blame. Today we reap. Or miss our golden harvest Today is given us souls to win Oh, then to save some dear ones from the burning Today we'll go to bring some sinner in The harvest white with reapers few is wasting and many souls will die and never know the love of Christ, the joy of sins forgiven. Oh, let us weep and love and pray and go. Today we reap or miss our golden harvest. Today is given us souls win. Oh, then to save some dear ones from the burning. Today we'll go to bring some sin. Amen. You may be seated at this time, and we are going to uh, hear from some of our other missionaries right now. Hey friends in Pendleton, I just wanted to take a moment and give you a brief video update for your missions conference. And first I want to say thank you. Thank you so much for your continual support, for your prayers for us. It means the world. It really does. Uh, but as we're looking at Grants Pass, Oregon and the ministry that's happening here, God has just been at work and it's been evident from the people he's bringing in uh, to the different ways he's provided for us, it just blows my mind. Right now we're actually transitioning from our very first building to our next building. And this second building is actually 
two times as big as the one we're meeting in now, but about the exact same cost. And so that is such a blessing that God just dropped in our lap. Now, right now we're going through the process of fixing it up, getting it ready to meet and, and be worthy to be called a church. And so, uh, Lord willing, in two weeks, we'll be meeting at this new location on April 3rd. And so be praying for us as we transition. But again, we thank you all for your support throughout this time as we see souls saved, uh, that it may be fruit that abounds to your account. And so thank you all. Keep doing what you're doing. And I pray that God continues to bless your church there. Hope you guys have a great missions conference. Hello everyone at Berean Baptist Church. My name is Fair here, reporting from Papua New Guinea. We're here in the city of Fort Moresby, getting ready to go to the airport, get on the aircraft to go head towards America. We hope you have a good missions conference. And we want to thank you for being faithful to support us over the years. Our goal is to finish well. We're truly our Savior of worthy. We thank you and we love you. We pray to God that you would have a good missions conference this year. Wish we could be there. We will be in America doing medical, dental, and also being there for our daughters granddaughter's graduation on uh, May the 20th, 21st. Okay, it's your turn, sir. We love you all. Meanwhile, we'll be praying for your conference and that there will be a, a good turnout and that you have a really good time of being with other missionaries and Lord of bless you all. And remember, the 71 souls that got saved in 2021, William Baptist Church has had a part in that. Amen. To God be the glory, great things he has done. Bye now. Bye. Hello everyone, uh, good evening. It's a pleasure to be able to greet you uh, through by making a video this way. Today is Sunday. We're just getting back from our baptism celebration. Today we had five people who got baptized. People who, who showed their faith by way of baptism to, to the rest of us. So we, we're getting home. We're a little tired, but we're very happy. And uh, we're recording this video for you. For two reasons. First, we want to give thanks and thank you all. To, to, to God first. And in second place, to you guys. And, and secondly, I want to thank you for uh, your, your prayers and your help. And I, I want to encourage you to keep uh, be, being a part of our ministry here in Chile. Here in and greetings to the pastor and, and, and uh, warm uh, greetings to him for the way he treats us as missionaries and this closeness that he has to our ministry. I want to uh, uh, share with you that we are very happy because uh, as about two, uh, two years ago, we have been restricted we have not been able to meet because of the pandemic and now thankfully it's, it's opening up a little bit more and uh, in, uh, April 10th we're actually going to be starting something we're going to start a new uh, church planning project an hour from here We've waited a long time. But God has opened our doors and, and we're going to start uh, April 10th. It's about one hour from here. It's a city called Melipilla. And Melipilla is a, is a term, indigenous term, that talks about uh, the center of spirits. That's, that's the name that it has. But we hope to, to go there to that city with the word of God. We have a family there that is going to uh, help 
run all this. Y vamos a comenzar haciendo reuniones en su casa. We're going to start doing, uh, having meetings in their house. Y, y vamos a estar invitando personas. We're going to, we're going to be inviting people all around there to, to go to the meetings. Quiero terminar este tiempo agradeciendo. And I want to finish this uh, video saying. Pero pidiéndole que sigan orando por nosotros. Asking you to keep praying for us. Porque queremos hacerlo para la honra del Señor. Because we want to do it for, for God's glory. Y que si en el futuro saben de esta iglesia bautista en Melipilla. And if in the future you guys hear about uh, this Baptist church in Melipilla. Va a ser la obra de Dios. It's going to be God's work. Como resultado de sus oraciones. Resulting because of your prayers. Y ustedes son parte de esa inversión you, en ese lugar. You are part of the investment in that place. Un abrazo grande para cada uno de ustedes. A, a warm greeting to you. Y este tiempo de misiones. And in, in this time of missions. Sea un tiempo de bendición y de fortaleza. We también. hope that it's a, it's a blessing to you and, a, and, a, and it encourages you. Que el Señor les bendiga grandemente. And God bless you very much. Un saludo de toda nuestra familia Lara aquí en and, Chile. A, a warm greeting from our family, uh, all my family to yours. Hasta pronto. See you later. God bless. Okay, Mrs. Watkins, how did the interpreter do? Pretty good. Okay. <laughs> to ask her, she's fluent in Spanish. <laughs> Years ago, we had Ramon Lara here, and he came with a man who was supposed to be an interpreter, and she's sitting beside me, and, he, and he's saying what he thinks Ramon Lara said, and my wife's going, so anyway, so anyway, glad to hear that. At this time, um, some of our last opportunities to hear uh, from our missionary friends who are here, and so I'm going to start uh, with, uh, with uh, Brother Matheny. Brother Matheny, I'm going to have you come up and, uh, and first give your testimony, but then if there are any other final words you want to give to the congregation, if you would do that, please. <laughs> Two. Yeah. How many Baptist minutes do you need? Oh, well, these are Baptist minutes. You should have said so. Uh, amen. I really enjoyed being here, and I really enjoyed watching all the missionaries on the video. Very, very good. When you see these people all over the world, you realize, hey, these people have given their lives. Well, praise the Lord. Like, you know, it was a great sacrifice. It would have been a great sacrifice if we had wasted oh, no, it on good. the world. And the Bible says, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Um, okay, this is a little bit, you know, you're, some of you read that book I had. Well, I, I got in a real bad car wreck. I was a lost kid, and I was just so very self-centered and prideful and, and dumb. And I was always racing around, brand new car, and I wrecked it on the 41st Street overpass here in Everett, Washington. I almost killed myself, and uh, was in the hospital for a month. And on the second day there, they called my parents down. I was losing blood in my left kidney, and they come down there, and I woke up just for a few seconds, and I saw my dad standing there, and and, and because of that, something happened that really changed my life. Uh, very self-centered, and I saw my dad there, and I loved my dad. I didn't realize I was hurting other people that loved me, you know. And then I loved, but I just didn't think about it because I was dumb. And I realized at that moment I was hurting my dad. And so I made a decision there in that hospital bed that when I got out of there, I was going to do something to make him happy. Every, everything before that was to make me happy. <laughs> All I did was almost kill myself. And so I thought, okay, I'll do that. And so two or three months afterwards, my dad says, I want you to join the Navy. Gary, you got to go join the Navy Seabees. It was the last branch of the service I wanted to be in, CBs or construction battalion. I, ha I didn't want to be in any branch of the service of anything. Uh, I'm proud of it now, but then I, I just, you know, and I said, okay. And he's, he was surprised I said, okay, it was because of that decision. So I began to obey the Bible, amen? I became a diver because I was in the Navy, and I saw this uh, guy filling a request to become a diver. I asked him about it. And he said, uh, well, if you're interested, you ought to fill that in. <laughs> I'm not interested. Now I just wonder what you're doing. And I went back the next day and says, where are those requests at? Oh, you want to become a diver? I said, no, but where are they? I did it because my dad liked watching Lloyd Bridges and Sea Hunt. And I, he, that was it. That was the reason. And one time he said, watching Lloyd Bridges, he says, Gary, we ought, to, we, we ought to take up diving. I go, hmm. I had no desire to do that. I'm very proud of it now. Then I didn't want to. The fifth commandment, I'm lost and I'm obeying the fifth commandment. The fifth commandment does not say... Honor your father and mother and you will go to heaven. All it's, it says, two promises. Honor your father and mother that you, thou mayest live long on the earth. So how can I live longer by obeying my parents? Well, if your parents tell you not to play in the middle of the street and you disobey them, you'll have a very short life. <laughs> and that it may be well with thee. 
and God so designed this earth, we started obeying our parents, things started to go, and things started making a big turn in my life. I went into the Navy. I told my dad years later about that, and I, he said, that was the best thing for you. And I said, well, yeah, it was, especially the Navy, amen. Anyway, I was in there, and because of that diving thing, and I started really getting into it, I went to this second-class diving school and first-class diving school and saturation diving school, and man, my ego was so big, and I was so cool. And uh, I ended up on this, you know, this top-secret mission over there in Russia, and, um, and I wanted to make the dive, and they told us only eight of you are getting in the water. Nuclear boats only have two divers, and they're second-class divers. We were saturation divers, we had big egos, very competitive guys, and there were 21, 21 divers in one sub. And they had two diving stations to keep you alive in the water, and all this cool stuff I could talk for hours about. But I, I prayed, and, I, and I'd say it. I got saved in the Navy, because about six times people witnessed to me. And uh, I thought, what's the matter with these people? No, you know, nobody ever bothered me before about this. And I have a church. I'm Catholic. What's, just leave me alone. And I thought, you know, I started reading the Bible. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. Amen. And, and I, it took me a year and a half. I didn't read it every day. I read maybe two or three times a week. And I only read one or two pages. And I got to... I got to I won't finish all this stuff, so I just, but I got to um, John chapter 9, and the, 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 blind, the man who was born blind, and I was reading it, and I started laughing. I said, there's this guy, he's born blind, which means he had never read anything in his life, had no education, and he was putting to shame these Pharisees who were the best educated people in the land, you know. He had outsmarted them, and he said, I don't know who he is. All I know is I was blind, and I'm, now, I, now I can see. And they say, well, tell us some more. He says, why, do you want to be his apostle? I got real mad at him and threw him out. And I just thought that was funny. And then that was when, it's a strange thing, that was the first time I said, I hope this is true. Because, see, I didn't have any faith, but I just kept reading it. And then I got to Acts 16, 31, what must I do to be saved? I said, yeah, what do I have to do to get saved? And uh, doing, uh, faith is the only thing you can do without doing anything. And, and uh, believe on, it didn't say believe about him. It says believe on him. Like, I can believe about this chair will hold me, but I'm not trusting it until I'm on it. And so I actually have to transfer faith from, I, I got my church, I got done a few brownie points out here, take my faith out of all that and trust Jesus Christ. That's when I was saved. I put my faith in him. When I go to heaven, he's the one who will get me there. Nobody else will. I can't get myself there. I don't deserve to be there. And nobody here does, or outside here. Anyway, um, in Siberia, and I prayed, and I said, Lord, please let me make this dive. And that's when I surrendered, because that verse is, whosoever, whosoever, whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. Whosoever shall lose his life for my sake, the same shall find it. And when I prayed, and I said, Lord, I will serve you even if you don't let me make this dive. I don't want to explain this to you, but making that dive was the biggest idol in my whole life, okay? <laughs> Have you ever wanted to do something so bad, all you want God to do is bless what you want, and I don't want to hear anything else, just what I want, Lord. <laughs> and when I prayed that prayer, and I said, Lord, I will make the dive even if you don't let me, I mean, I will serve you even if you don't let me make the dive. That's when I lost my life. And that's when I found the life the Lord wanted me to have, which was to serve him. That's good. Now, I'm in charge here. Amen? I, I might zero. I'd have nothing if it wasn't for him. I honestly think I wouldn't be alive. I was pretty reckless. Um, now, I want to say this. You have a great church. I don't want to brag on you too much. You get a big eagle like I did, okay? But you have a wonderful church. Somebody said they've been here for 25 years. You've had three pastors, and every single pastor's had a heartbeat for missions. And, and I've heard this in Bible college. Missions is the heartbeat of the church. Keeps your focus outside. Amen? Look at all this young lady and, and these, these couples, an elderly couple. And what's the matter with them people? Don't they know they could stay here in the States and watch TV until they die? What's the matter with them? <laughs> anyway, um, that's what I wanted to share. And so I'm, I am very, I'm, I was this way before, but I'm more this way now. When I come to your church, God pumps me up, so amen. At this time, I'm going to ask Brother Kyo to come up, and he is going to uh, share a few final words to you, Lord Ken. Uh, 
All right. Uh, just thank you again for allowing me to be with you, uh, Pastor, uh, for your church, your kindness, your generosity, um, and loving God, and because you love God, uh, you guys are doing your part to uh, helping reach the world for, for Lord Jesus Christ. Let me uh, I'll share this verse. This verse I've been preaching on uh, 1 Timothy 2 4, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And I think about my people. I'm thankful for the first American missionary, Arthur L. Hammond, that went to Cambodia in 1923 until now. And uh, for a long time, my people don't know the truth. And uh, when people don't know God and the gospel, they don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, they live in fear. They fear of uh, uh, the demons, uh, evil spirit. They worship the ancestor. Um, they wear a red string to protect them from demon. That's when people don't know the truth of the gospel. So, but I, I thank you so much for allowing me to be with you, and I'm I'm always thankful to God for allowing my family to come to America. And coming to America, we heard the gospel, and I'm saved. I'm thankful that God called me back to reach my people for God. Amen? Amen? But thank you so much, Pastor. Okay, I was wondering, but then I was uh, panning through the congregation. In that front row right there, there is a pile of change. And that has to belong to somebody. And I believe somebody brought it for the missionary change offering. We have two offerings tonight. We have a, a love offering for the missionary, but we have the missionary change offering. And by the way, every single penny that goes into these change jars is going to be divided among the missionaries that came to present their ministry here. It's going to be wonderful. We're going to pour it into insulated bags. We're going to send it to them COD. It'll be fabulous. <laughs> And uh, actually, no, but anyway, it's really a way we can help them, and it's a wonderful thing. So we're going to stand, because it's time for the chorus, I'm a missionary helper, and you have change, it's time to bring it down, let's fill that jar, let's sing together. I'm a missionary helper, praying every day, I'm a missionary helper my pennies go god's way bringing precious souls to jesus my heart is all aglow i'm a missionary helper pray and give and go I'm a missionary helper, praying every day. I'm a missionary helper, my pennies go God's way. Bringing precious souls to Jesus, my heart is all aglow. I'm a missionary helper. Per, pray and give and go. You go. What was he doing there? He's paying for me to sing the song. That's what he was doing. Wonderful. Okay, let's see here. Um, go ahead and remain standing. Brother Matheny, it's wonderful that you picked that particular verse because the next song we're going to sing, number 549, is Whosoever Will. And we're singing that song, and, and as soon as we're done with that song, the mixed ensemble, we're going to sing. So you can kind of come up while we sing this song here. 549. Whosoever hear it, shout, shout the sound. Spread the blessed tidings all the world around. Tell the joyful news where every man is found, whosoever will may come, whosoever will, whosoever will, send the proclamation of hail and hill, tis the loving Father calls the wanderer home, whosoever will may come. 
come, whosoever cometh need not delay, now the door is open, enter all you may, Jesus is the true, the only living way, whosoever will may come, whosoever will, whosoever will, send the proclamation of Vale and Hill, tis a loving Father, calls the wanderer home, whosoever will may come, whosoever will, the promise is secure, whosoever will, forever must endure, whosoever will, tis life forevermore, whosoever will may come, whosoever will, whosoever will, send the proclamation of veil and ill, wander home, whosoever will may come. Amen, and uh, you may uh, be seated. Uh, the song that we're singing, it is our year theme this year, but it's also the theme of every missionary. Uh, nothing will be accomplished unless Christ is the focus, and so we're going to sing about that.
At this time, I have one more greeting, and uh, the Far North director is going to go, why haven't I heard about this guy? It is greetings in the name of the Lord. We are grateful for y'alls. What is a Far Northerner saying y'alls for? Well, that's because this is an Alabama swamp boy who married, a, oh no, he's a Florida swamp boy. I got to get that right. He fought the Alabama swamp games when he was a teenager. He's a Florida swamp boy who married a Florida swamp lady and went to one of the most northern reaches of Alaska there is. And he said, we're grateful for y'all's continued prayer and support these last years. It has been an immense blessing. We are humbled by your care for us. We have three personal prayer requests. My eldest brother, Robert Warren, passed away last Sunday morning at the age of 45. He said, I just squeaked out of St. Mary's on a bush plane the next day between ground blizzards and after a smooth, quick trip of 22 hours, arrived in Pensacola, Florida. And his funeral was just this uh, past Saturday. Uh, he preached at the graveside, and I haven't had a chance to hear a report for him, but he's just praying for people to be saved. It says, pray for my family to be safe in St. Mary's while I am gone. Listen to this, especially for no electrical problems to arise, a few weeks ago, the meter box halfway melted, and the church side is without power, save for two extension cords that are ran from the parsonage side of the building to keep the Toyo stoves running for heat. The electrical parts are ordered, but have not arrived yet due to a severe shortage in Alaska since the coronavirus lockdowns began. Pray for my shoulder. It was injured about a month ago from pickaxing, and this is what you have to do in Alaska. You can't dig in the ground. Pick axing six graves in the last few months and snow machining to the COVID counseling camp to witness to men from other villages. It is an old injury that has reared its ugly head again. The doctors are hoping not to have to operate if I, if I cannot use my right arm until May. So the way the doctors won't operate is if he doesn't use his arm at all until May. Pray for us to keep plugging away for God's glory. He is on his throne, and we want to keep our focus on bringing him glory with our lives here on earth. Pray for souls to be saved in the ministry and for saved souls to grow in the Lord. God bless. It's important to understand he's in an Indian village called St. Mary's. He is the only preacher in St. Mary's. There used to be a Russian Orthodox Church. All those buildings have been rotting since the 1920s. Uh, there, is a, there is a Catholic Church there, but the priest never comes out. He is the pastor of the village, and he has seen many saved, and he has started Independent Fundamental Baptist Church in the most unlikely place on planet Earth, right there on the Yukon River. So you continue to remember uh, to pray for him. And um, I'm, I, I don't like this part because we're, we're slowly but surely uh, closing into the end of this thing, and I really don't want it to end. And, I mean, somebody gave me an out. They said, Pastor, there's extra desserts downstairs. Should I leave them out? I said, no, put them away. I thought, what was I thinking? I could have kept this thing going. And, um, but um, we're going to sing uh, uh, Brother Balawa's favorite song. I'm going to stand as we sing this song. It's number 275. Uh, what a wonderful hymn of the faith. It is well with my soul. 275. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea Billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul, it is well with my soul. It is Let this blessed assurance come. 
On August 16, 1896, gold was discovered in the Yukon. This triggered a stampede of 100,000 prospectors who rushed into the Klondike region. Most traveled by way of the Chilkoot Pass. Every prospector made multiple trips up this mountain ladder, hauling nearly one ton of equipment. Untold numbers died in their rush to the gold. By 1899, it was all over, and most never struck gold. It has been said, the world will do for gold what the Christian will not do for God. This is a striking accusation which holds entirely too much truth. It is a truth that is especially observable in the far north. In Job 38.22, the Lord asked, Hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow? It is obvious that the Klondikers considered the treasures of the snow. Today, the world continues a similar quest across the far north. In Alaska, men and women brave raging winter seas, risking life and limb to harvest the big money crop of Alaskan king crab. In Canada, they endure the bone-chilling cold in search of precious minerals. In Greenland, billions of dollars are being spent in hope of finding gold, diamonds, and other riches. But the greatest treasure of the snow is not the natural resources found there. Rather, it is the people who inhabit the North. This treasure is of such great value Jesus died for them, that they might believe on him and have eternal life. But they perish unless they are told. The sad fact is, in the far north, the world continues to do for gold what many Christians are not doing for God. It is time for this to change. But for this to happen, there must be those with a pioneering spirit who cry out, Lord, here am I, send me. As we consider the far north, we start in Alaska, a land of incredible beauty. Its 50-plus glaciers, rugged mountains, and wildlife are amazing. But more importantly, some 737,000 people in need of the gospel call this place home. Across the continent and off the eastern seaboard of Canada is Greenland. Greenland's landscape and coastlines are spectacular. Its winter skies are filled with wonder. 
and under the seemingly endless snowfields of the north are unfathomable riches in precious minerals. But the greatest treasure of Greenland is found mostly in its southwestern fjords, where some 57,000 people make their home. In these cities and villages are people desperate for someone to bring them the good news that Jesus saves. To the west of Greenland, stretching from coast to coast across the North American continent, is Canada. From its incredible coastlines to its bountiful prairie lands, to the jagged peaks of the Canadian Rockies, its natural beauty is overwhelming. Canada is also dotted with great cities where its rich history lies next to its modern vision for the future. It is in these cities that the majority of Canada's 37 million people live. Canada is unique among the lands of the far north because of its aggressive immigration program. With one in five Canadians being immigrants, the government plans to welcome over 1.2 million more from 2021 through 2023. While these people are flooding in from around the world, they are arriving from the 1040 window in vast numbers, providing missionaries and churches an awesome opportunity to impact the gospel ministry around the world. As mass immigration becomes commonplace, Christians must be strategic in their missionary efforts. This is why at BIMI, we are introducing the 1040 North project. The concept is simple. The Lord has placed a great door and effectual in the far north that opens paths around the world, especially in the 1040 window. Right now, there is an urgent need for laborers to plant churches and disciple believers. We are asking the Lord to raise up from these immigrants an army of Christians who will assist in the gospel ministry both in the far north and their birthlands. Already, through the ministries of BIMI missionaries, the Lord is using Ethiopian immigrants living in Vancouver who are supplying land, buildings, and aid to missionaries in Ethiopia. In Montreal, an immigrant from Senegal planning to study engineering was discipled by a BIMI church planter. He is now enrolled in Bible college with a desire to reach the people in his birthland. Through the 1040 North Project, we are asking the Lord to duplicate these types of testimonies over and over. Our desire is to reach the people of the far north with the gospel and through them reach the world for Jesus Christ. But for this to become a reality, we need Christians who recognize it is time to bring the gospel to these people. We must not be negligent in reaching, training, and mobilizing the greatest resources in the far north, the human resources. May we put an end to the accusation that the world does for gold what the Christian will not do for God. Will you pray with us? Will you help us? Will you go? It's so good to be with you tonight, and uh, it has been a, a joy, a tremendous joy to be with you in this church, and you've been such a blessing to us. We appreciate it so much, um, your hospitality, your kindness to us, all of the meals, and um, we, have, we have joked a little bit about those meals, and, um, uh, but they've been tremendous, and you've been an encouragement to us, and we appreciate that so very much. Uh, besides working in the far north, and the, I think the video speaks for itself, there's a tremendous need there uh, for missionaries in the far north, for church planters, and, and I believe truly that if we would be diligent, we could uh, reach out from there around the world with the gospel um, and, and see God do great things. And so pray with us, if you would, about, uh, about uh, the need for laborers in the north. Um, uh, there are, there's not enough laborers anywhere. The, the, old, the old story is still the same story, and that's that the, the Lord of the harvest is saying, hey, listen, I need laborers. And, uh, and so pray with us, if you would, that uh, the Lord would raise up laborers, not just for the far north, that's our place, that's our burden and our passion, but uh, for all over uh, the world. And so if you would join us in prayer. A couple of other things that we get to do at BIMI, I wear two hats there. Um, I'm the Far North Director, and when I'm not doing the Far North Director's job, which is actually all the time, um, in the other time of that, uh, when I can kind of push some stuff aside, I'm also the Media Director there, and so uh, the video you just saw and a number of other videos like that we produce and, and put those together, and, and um, 
and the Lord uses those all over the world, and, and um, they're seen by thousands of people. Those types of videos, other videos as well, uh, you can check out our website, BIMI.org, and you'll see them there. There's some information on the table we'd love for you to pick up. Um, and then also, one of the ministries that uh, I've been involved with, and my family and I have been involved with, uh, even before becoming Far North Director, and for some time now at BIMI, is one that's very close to my heart. It's called Camp Bimmy. And uh, Camp Bimmy is not, first of all, it's not a camp. Um, most Bible colleges will give you college credit for attending Camp Bimmy. Uh, it's, it's a one week in the summer, but a three week program, and also combined with a um, missions trip to a foreign field. And this isn't your average missions trip. We hosted a, a, what we call a smart trip when we were in Quebec. And the missionary or the, the students will come and they'll do exactly what you do as a missionary. Uh, the group that came with us, they, they uh, woke up at, uh, oh, I don't know, four or five o'clock in the morning, began to assemble John and Romans, and we put them all together. And, and then we would spend the morning distributing those John and Romans, but we were in a building program at the same time, and so we would go and eat lunch somewhere with them, and then we would go to our building and work on the building project until well after dark, and we'd go home, we'd do devotions with them, give them a couple hours of sleep and start it all over again the next day. And they put over 25,000 John and Romans into our community for us while they were there. And uh, it's just, a, it's, a, it's a neat program. And it's not a program to talk you into missions. In fact, here's what we believe. If we can talk you into it, somebody else can talk you out of it. But if God puts it on your heart, nobody will talk you out of it. And so we'll spend a lot of time trying to talk you out of it, tell you the truth. It's the reality of missions. And uh, if you would do this, if you are 25 years, 16 to 25 years old, go through and pick up one of these on our table and uh, talk to your pastor about it. You can't come without your pastor's recommendation and a number of other recommendations as well, 16 to 25. And then if you're 25 to 125, you go after them and pick these up and you go and and talk to your pastor about it and pray about it and we'd love for you to come and we have had everybody it's minimum age of 16 there is no maximum age and we've had people i believe in their 70s come and attend camp bimmy and find out where do they fit in missions and uh, we'd love for you to at least consider it and again you can't come without your pastor's recommendation so uh, you you need to talk to him about it as well and again, thank you for allowing us to be here. We are in our Bibles tonight, and we are in 1 Kings chapter number 17. 1 Kings chapter number 17. I know, uh, you know, your Bible's probably flipping over, open to Matthew 16, but we finished that last night. And uh, 1 Kings 17. And, and I think that this passage kind of takes everything we've spoken about in these last several days together and just kind of combines it into one passage and, and kind of helps us to understand and illustrate all that we've been speaking about. Um, I've entitled the message, Giving by Faith. In 1918, James Wells wrote the song that you and I are very, very familiar with, I'm sure, Living by Faith in Jesus Alone, Trusting, Confiding in His Great Love, From All Harm Safe in His Sheltering Arm, I'm Living by Faith and Feel No Alarm. Our Bible is inspired, we don't change that. Our hymnal, not inspired, and we can change words and be okay. And so I've changed the words to that to simply say this, giving by faith in Jesus above, trusting, confiding in his great love. From all harm safe in his sheltering arm, I'm giving by faith and feel no alarm. And we want to come to a place where there's a lady who gives by faith and she had every reason to feel alarm, but seems to me that she was very calm and cool and collected about what she was doing. And so let's read 1 Kings chapter number 17, verse 1 uh, through verse number 16. You follow along in your Bible, if you would, please, as I read and notice what the Word of God says. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew or rain these years. And we know from other places in the Bible, now this is three years that he's talking about, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, 
Now the word came to Elijah and said, Get out of there now, get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens, of the, uh, uh, the ravens to feed thee there. If you mark your Bible, would you mark the word there in verse number four? It is an important word. Verse number four in the word there. Verse five now. So he went, Elijah went, and he did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and he dwelt by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. And that's about a year's time, actually. Verse 8, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. If you mark your Bible, would you mark the word there, that second one uh, at the end of the verse in verse number 9. So he arose and he went to Zarephath. And when, he had come, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there. And I would encourage you to mark that word there also. Gathering of sticks. And he called to her and he said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, fetch it he called to her and he said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not. Go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son." For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord send rain upon the earth. And that's about two years, by the way. And she did, and she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. Father, I pray that you'll bless our time in the Word. I pray that you'll speak to every heart. And I pray, God, that tonight, if somebody here doesn't know you as their personal Savior, isn't 100% certain if they were to die today, they would be instantaneously and forever in the presence of Jesus. Then I pray that they would receive him by faith even this evening. Maybe somebody's watching by way of the live stream that needs to be saved. We pray that you speak to every Christian heart and that you'll work in our lives and we would be submitted to do what you call us to do, what you impress upon our hearts to do as, as you work in our lives through the preaching of the word and the spirit of God ministers that to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. I think a lot of times we look at missionaries, and, and I know very often in, in my church, and, and I would do very much like Pastor Watkins, we'd have missionaries in, and we would, we would make much of missionaries, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that, uh, uh, the, the, but, uh, but we sometimes look at missionaries and we say, they're not exactly like the rest of us. They live above it all. They're never flustered, they're never annoyed, they never get frustrated. That's not true. It's not even remotely true. And one of the surest ways I know to aggravate a, min a missionary is to waste their time. Nobody likes their time to be wasted, but I've never met a missionary that does well when their time is being wasted. When we were raising our support to go to Quebec and, and plant a church there, we did it in a very, very different way. Uh, I, was, I was a brand new Christian. I didn't know about deputation and how long it was supposed to take and all that kind of stuff. And nobody ever told me it was supposed to take three years. And so when I went to, uh, when I went to BIMI and they, they said, how long is it going to take you to do deputation? I was sitting in a screening committee with a number of pastors and, and my director at the time. And, and they said, how long is it going to take you to do deputation? And I said, one year. And they laughed out loud. And they said, what makes you special? It takes the average missionary three years uh, to, to get their support. How are you going to do it in a year? And I said, easy. Whatever comes in in a year, we're going to call support. We're going to leave for the field. And that's what they did. 
And my director looked at me and he said, we'll talk later. And I said, okay, we'll talk, but it'll be a year. And we, I just knew God wanted us to do it that way. And, and so in one year's time, we scheduled 67 churches to be in. We went everywhere under the sun. Uh, we traveled from the northeast out to Utah, down into the deep south, up into the far north. We went across the Atlantic to Belgium. We went everywhere we could to get a meeting and to raise support and, and to get the support in that one year's time. And the Lord let us do that in that one year's time. Part of those meetings were held in Salt Lake City, Utah. And while we were there, we were going to be in five different churches. And, and the first pastor who had invited me to come out, he was asking me about my itinerary uh, one day, and he said to me, where are you going to be? And I told him the five churches or the four other churches that we would be in. And uh, he, he listened, and the last church I was going to be in, he, he stopped and he said, well, I don't know why you're going to go there. And I said, what do you mean you don't know why I'm going to go there? i got a meeting there. He said, oh, I don't, I, that's a waste of your time. I said, why is that a waste of my time? He said, well, they'll never support you. I said, what do you mean they're never going to support me? They don't even know me. He said, no, they're not going to support you. He said, listen, they don't support any missionaries who work with a mission board. Now, if a local church makes that their policy, fine. But I had told this pastor that I worked with BIMI. And I said, what do you mean they're not going to support me because I'm with, with, he goes, it's BIMI. I said, well, what's wrong with BIMI? I said, it's not just BIMI, it's any board. And I said, but no, I told him that we worked with a board. And he said, I don't care, they're not going to support you. I didn't like Salt Lake City to begin with, to tell you the truth. I remember one of the pastors calling me as we were leaving, and he had taken us on for support, and and he said to me, he said, hey, how do you like our state? I said, one, one, good, one good way to see it, my rearview mirror. I don't like it here, preacher. <laughs> I don't. So I'm going to be there for all these five churches, and I'm thinking, this guy is wasting my time. I could go home, and I don't have to be in Salt Lake City. And so we go to this last church. And can I tell you that I have less than a stellar attitude when I get there? And I think, okay, what do I, I, I want to go and I look at every missions prayer letter on the board. Because I want to see if they support anybody who works with a mission board. And sure enough, they don't. And I think, what in the world? I know, I, I, I know I told this pastor who I was and who I was associated with and all of this. And I'm thinking, he is wasting my time. I don't understand this. And then I meet the pastor, and I try to have a good attitude, and he says, listen, you have the whole service. He said, show your, show your at that time, show your slides. We clicked through them at that time, and show your slides, and give your testimony, and then get up and preach. Yes, sir. And I showed my slides with a bad attitude. Now, nobody could tell except for maybe my wife. God knew. I knew. Gave my testimony with a bad attitude. I know these other missionaries in this room have never done anything like this. I'm just telling you me. <laughs> and then I begin to preach with a bad attitude. And about 10 minutes into that, the Holy Spirit of God slapped me in the back of the head and said, Hey, son, this isn't about you. Amen. This isn't about what this church does and doesn't do. Straighten up. And the Holy Spirit and I had a little invitation moment there. And I did change my attitude. And I did try to make it right as I continued to preach. And I finished. And I sat down. And the pastor said to the church, he said, Church, we've never done it like this before. In fact, we've never done anything like this before. He said, but... Uh, we're going to do it tonight. He said, we have never voted to take a missionary on in the service in which they present. And we certainly have never supported a missionary with a mission board. He said, but tonight we're going to do, we're going to take a vote. He said, but before we do, he said, Brother Tony, I need to ask you a question. I'm sitting like right here where Pastor Watkins is sitting. And he said, he said, Tony, if we took you on for support, could we send our money to your local church? 
And I said, yes, sir, you could, but full disclosure, if you do that, my local church is going to send it to BIMI for uh, financial accountability, and then they're going to send it to me. And he looked at me and he said, I don't care what your church does with it after we send it to them. I don't want to send it to a board. I said, well, you could do it then. And that night they took us on for support. They voted unanimously to take us on for support. You know, sometimes the Lord has to put us in certain places just to remind us who's in charge and, and who's, who's running things and to test our faith. And, 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 and while the Lord was doing really special things and letting us raise our support, somewhere along the line, I took my eyes off of God as the one who was raising my support and I put it on local churches and, and on myself, I guess, and, and, and God said, you need to get your eyes back on me. And I tell you all that because as we come to this text tonight, the first thing that I, I see really in this text is the proving of the servant's faith. The proving of the servant's faith. And I see this as, as God says to Elijah, hey, you gotta, you gotta, go, to, you gotta go to the brook Cherith and then you're gonna go to Zarephath. Now in our text, Elijah, this great prophet of God, has just kind of burst onto the scene uh, during the reign of the wicked king Ahab and his wife Jezebel. And not long before Elijah's arrival, Ahab had built a house and an altar of worship for Baal in honor of his wife. I think it's very interesting to note that Baal was the Phoenician god of fertility and rain. <laughs> and Elijah arrives with a message of no more rain. And after that announcement, you and I know this, the Bible tells us that, that it was not just no rain, but no dew. And, and, and this is high desert, so you guys get it. You get a little bit of rain. I lived in Phoenix. No rain, three years. That is serious stuff. That means anybody who knows and, and lives already in a desert in an arid climate, and, and then you say no rain, three years, you instantly think famine, death is coming. And with that, Elijah becomes a wanted man. And Jezebel's plan has been to exterminate the worshipers of Jehovah God and bring in a, a new era of Baal worship. And, and, and the Bible says in, in chapter 18 that she started with executing a number of the prophets of the Lord. And, and so the Lord says, you know what, Elijah, here's your message. No more rain. But then he says, now go to Cherith, go to the brook Cherith, and I have appointed ravens to bring you food there. Now, you may or may not be familiar with the geography of the brook Cherith, but can I tell you that it is not a vacation destination. It's not a place that you would choose to go if you were going to go visit Israel, except for that you might want to see it because of this story. It's difficult to get to. It's a lonely place. There's no convenience stores there. There's no Walmart. Uh, there's nothing there to attract you. Uh, and, and, and it's really just a very difficult, it's more of a ravine, a difficult, lonely place to be. Now think about what God says. Go to the brook Cherith, and here's how I'm going to get you your food. Airborne garbage pickers are going to drop it off twice a day. You ever see what ravens eat? I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be thrilled about this new plan God had for my life. I don't even want to go to the brook Cherith, and now you're going to drop garbage out of the air for me to eat? And, and for it to be enough to eat, let me just kind of draw some pictures for you. How much did they have to, like, stuff into their beaks to get it to spit back out? I know we just all ate, so I'll stop there. <laughs> I think this is a test of Elijah's faith. You going to do what I tell you to do, Elijah? But by faith, Elijah goes. And by faith, Elijah remains for about a year until the brook dries up. And then God, in his, in his infinite wisdom, has a, a plan already prepared. And can I tell you that this one's even more bizarre? He says, I want you to go to Zarephath. 
So what's the big deal about Zarephath? Well, if you read in 1 Kings, uh, or 2 Kings rather, later on, you'll read that it's Zarephath of Zidon. Now, Zarephath of Zidon is about 80 to 100 miles north of the brook Cherith. It's in what we would call Gentile, or a Jew would call Gentile territory. And this is undoubtedly of more concern to Elijah about going here than it was to the brook Cherith. Because you see, Zarephath was a Phoenician city. And Zarephath belonged to Zidon. And I'm making a big deal out of that because 1 Kings 16 and verse 31 tells us who ruled Zarephath. Jezebel's daddy, the one who's married to Ahab. So Elijah is officially sent for two years behind enemy lines. I think now I'm happy that the ravens are dropping me garbage out of the air. I don't want to go to Zarephath. Can you imagine the Lord sends Elijah to Zarephath? And remember that the Bible tells us in 1 Kings 18 that, that Ahab has been hunting Elijah for all the time that he's at the brook Cherith. He's been hunting for, and he's been going from kingdom to kingdom and city to city, and he's been taking an oath of those in the city to say, we don't know where Elijah is. Can you imagine that there must have been wanted posters of Elijah all over Zarephath? And the Lord says, hey, you go to Zarephath. And there in Zarephath, I have appointed a widow woman to sustain thee. Now, no doubt this is a jump up from the ravens. But, but, in that day, most widow ladies, I mean, they could, they could cook a good meal, I'm sure, but they don't have a lot of money to cook an extra meal. They know how to put a child in line and probably even an unruly prophet in line, but they can't protect you from an army. And Elijah is now heading off to another place that I'm not sure I would have gone. I surely wouldn't want to have gone. And when you read the text, you have to wonder, why is God doing this? What is he doing in Elijah's life? And then when you really think about it, I think it's really not that hard to understand. Uh, Watchman Nee, who was a great preacher from not so long ago, put it this way. He said, because of our proneness to look at the bucket and forget the fountain, God has frequently to change the means of supply to keep our eyes fixed on the source of the supply. Why did God send Elijah to the brook Cherith? Why did God send uh, Elijah to Zarephath? Because there is where God appointed his needs to be met. Right there. God pre-programmed the GPS of the ravens to drop the food at the brook Cherith. And if Elijah didn't go to the brook Cherith, he would have suffered the famine that everybody else su suffered. And if he didn't go to Zarephath, he wouldn't have met the widow woman there to meet him, to, uh, to meet his needs. And sometimes the Lord has to put our faith to the test. And I think it was Charles Spurgeon who said, a faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. And, and I'm asking you tonight, what will you do when the Lord tests your faith in this way? When he says to you, Increase your faith promise by X amount. Right there on that card, that's what I want you to write. Or he says, hey, I want you to go there with the gospel. Maybe Cambodia, maybe Romania, maybe somewhere in the far north. I want you to go there. By the way, Cambodia is not a vacation destination. I mean, maybe parts of it. Romania is not. Most of the far north, not a, a vacation destination. People are like, oh, let's go to Alaska on that one sunny day. In July. <laughs> but what will you do when the Lord says, that's where I want you to go. You go there. Or you write this there on that card. Let's move on and see not just the, the proving of the, of, the, of the servant's faith, but let's look at the proof of our sovereign's faith. Look what happens. So he went and he did according to the word of the Lord. Now that's important. He did according to the word of the Lord. And when he did that, the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. 
And by the way, I don't know how God did it, but I don't think the bread and the flesh were trash. I don't think they were garbage. I know these are garbage pickers, but I think somehow God pre-programmed their GPS and pre-programmed these garbage pickers to get good bread and, 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 and make sure it was good flesh, clean flesh for his, for his prophet. I don't think it was leftovers. And then he goes down to Zarephath. And when he gets to Zarephath, right there in the gate, there's this widow woman, just like God said there would be. It's not a surprise, or it shouldn't surprise us at least. And Elijah, when he went to those places where he was appointed to go, and he passed the test of, test of faith, and God said, you go there, and he did. And he said, go there, and he did. When he did that, God did exactly what he promised he would do. God's faithful. You can trust him always. So the Bible says God told him to go to the brook, and he did. And the ravens brought him meals daily. God said, go to Zarephath, and there'll be a widow woman there. And there was, and she fed him daily. And it's interesting because the Bible says that the Lord said, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. But that word command doesn't really speak of a verbal declaration as much as it does a divine determination to have a woman in just the right place at just the appointed time for the appointed reason. And if you search the scriptures, you'll find out this is how God works constantly through his word and in our lives. God is always prepared at both ends of any situation to cause his will to be accomplished. If he says to Abraham, uh, a servant, I want you to go to the well and find a, a bride for Isaac, and he goes there, then there, Rebekah will be drawing water. And if Jacob says, go down into Egypt in a time of famine, then there will be Joseph to meet the need. And if he says Israel, sends Israel spies into Jericho, then there's a Rahab raised up to help them. And if Jonah is on the run and in disobedience from God, then there is a whale who has its GPS program to be just in the right spot in the middle of the sea to pick up that disobedient prophet and bring him back to the place that God told him to go to in the first place. If Mordecai is begging the Lord to deliver his people from the threats that they have been under, then King Ahasuerus is rendered sleepless and he's made to search the state records and befriend Mordecai. If a Samaritan woman with less than a stellar reputation has to meet the Savior at a well at noonday, then Jesus must pass through Samaria. If a lame man who sits by the beautiful gate needs more than silver and gold, then Peter and John are directed to go there. If an Ethiopian woman is desirous to understand uh, God's word, then Philip is, or, is sent to meet that Ethiopian eunuch. If Cornelius is praying for the opening of the gospel, then Peter is sent there to meet him with that. If a certain devout woman is holding a weekly prayer meeting in Philippi, then Paul is sent to a river in Philippi to meet her there with the gospel. And if Adam and Eve plunge the world into sin in the garden, then God has already prepared Jesus Christ to come to this earth to seek and to save that which is lost. Yeah. And aren't you glad tonight that God knew that you would need to meet Jesus? Good. All of sin and come short of the glory of God. Amen. There's none righteous, no, not one. I'm not on my way to heaven because I'm good or because I'm a missionary, because I've been baptized or because I've gone to church or because I served as an altar boy as a kid. I'm going to heaven because Jesus said, I come to seek and to save that which is lost. Yeah. And God knew that there would be sin in the garden. It would pass on to all for, for whereas by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin so that death passed upon all men. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Aren't you glad that God has always prepared at both ends? And can I say this? If a missionary needs to get to the field, then there's a local church prepared there somewhere. If, if, if a missionary needs to get to Cambodia or Romania or somebody needs to get to the far north, then there's a church in Pendleton, Oregon that says, God says, I'm going to meet your need there. Or in, in Sandy, Utah, as was the case with us. You remember what the Bible says to Esther? 
And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. The proof of our sovereign's faithfulness. Please understand, this isn't God pre-programming us so that we have no choice. We all have a choice. Abraham didn't have to go to Moriah. Uh, God didn't have to send Jesus. You don't have to accept him, but I advise that you do. You don't have to support missionaries, but you've been blessed because you have. You say, how do you know that? Because my God shall supply you all your needs. We're going to see in a moment when God puts a person in a certain place, that person still needs to believe and exercise faith and obey in order to be used. And so I see the, I see the proof of our sovereign's faith. And then notice number three, and I'm trying to move quickly. Notice number three, I see, the, uh, I see a person of stunning faith. A person of stunning faith. Verse 9 and 10, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose, and he went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a, the widow, the widow woman, not a widow woman, the widow woman that God had appointed to be there, was there gathering of sticks, and he called to her, and he said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. Now this is a Gentile woman. She is undoubtedly aware of Elijah's status as a wanted man. She is undoubtedly aware of the consequences uh, attached to helping a prophet on the run. And by the way, who does everybody blame for the famine in the land? The prophet. Ahab blames the prophet. Everybody blames the prophet. And so she knows all this. In her mind, She's probably blaming the prophet as well for what's going on. And in her mind, it hasn't rained for all this time. And when we meet her, she is gathering, the Bible says, two sticks to cook her last meal. Have you ever thought about that? Two sticks? What are you going to cook on a fire that is only two sticks big? Half a ramen noodle? This isn't going to be a great meal. Yet knowing all these negative consequences attached to aiding and abetting the prophet on the run, she decides by faith to help him. And Elijah said, fetch a little water. And she's on her way. And he said, make a morsel of bread for me first and then feed your son after." Have you ever thought that one through? Wait a minute, we're dying because of you, and now you want me to feed you before I feed my son? Wow. I'll be honest, I, I, don't, I don't know if I have that kind of faith. The kind of faith it would take to say, I'll take the food out of my child's mouth to feed you a stranger? That everybody's blaming for this in the first place? How did she get that kind of faith? Remember where she is. Zarephath. Who's the God there? Baal. What's he in charge of? Rain. How's that working out? Not so well. Who's Elijah's God? Oh, he's Jehovah. What did he say? No rain. I think that the widow woman must have thought, if Elijah's God can control the rain, then he can probably meet my needs as well. Wow, but her faith is stunning to me. It's no wonder the Lord decided to use her. And you and I, we have, we have God's fully completed word in our hands, and we can read it cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation. So many times we get in our car. Got in our car in Muncie, Indiana a couple weeks ago. Had to get to Newport, Oregon in three days to get to a next, our next meeting. Kind of know the route, but not completely. And what if there's a traffic jam or what if there's something I get to get around? So what do I do? Well, I pull my brain out of my pocket and I say, hey, Siri, get me to Newport, Oregon. And she maps something out. And I never even look at the map to see if it's right. I just follow her directions all the way across the country. 
Why do I have more faith in Siri than I do God? Why, why did she make this choice? I think ultimately she made this choice because she was in a situation where there really was no other choice. She, could, she knew she couldn't trust Baal. He failed. He wasn't bringing the rain. So who do I trust? Well, I'll trust this other God. And, and I would say this. I would say this. I, I, I ask God regularly, help me to never get so behind in my faith that you put me in a place where I have no choice but to trust you. I, I want to I be able to have a faith that will trust God even when it doesn't make a whole bunch of sense. By the way, if it makes sense, it doesn't take faith. You ever thought that? If you could reason it out, it wouldn't take any faith. And so I, I see in this, I see the proving of the servant's faith. I see the proof of our sovereign's faith. I see a person, a stunning faith. And I see a proper showing of faith. How did this, what is this proper showing of faith? Well, think about what happened between this widow woman and Elijah. He said, hey, listen, go, go get me a cake first, and then afterwards make for you and your son. And by the way, if you'll do that, God says there'll be enough all through the rest of the famine to feed you and your son. Don't worry about it. Here's the order of events. You cannot reverse them. You can't mix them up in any way. She heard the promises. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. She believed the word. And her actions displayed her belief because our beliefs are always going to dictate our actions. And so she obeyed the word. And then she gave by faith. You say, well, the first day she had bios. Yeah, half a ramen noodle whatever you can cook on two sticks. But she and her household ate after that. And every day after that first day, she gave by faith. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the widow woman? She goes in, and, and, and it's day two now. She's already made the cakes the first day, and she goes in, and she knows she used all the meal from yesterday, and she knows she used all the oil from yesterday. And she goes in, she uncovers the barrel, and there's some meal in there. Whew! You might even do a little holy dance. I know we don't do that here. Never done it like that before. Then she goes to the cruise of oil, and she uncovers it, and she, she begins to pour trepidly, and it starts pouring out. And whoo! There's a little oil. And we're going to eat again. And we're going to eat again. And we're going to eat again. You say, how long? Two years. Wow. And the first day she gave according to her power, to quote what Paul says about the Macedonian churches in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And then from that point forward, she gave beyond her power, her ability. But not beyond God's ability. And you're only being asked to make a one-year commitment tonight, not a two-year but if it was two years, you could trust God for it. This is exactly, this is exactly what, 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 what we see in the Bible time and time again. And this woman's, this woman's faith, this order of events is so important that Jesus speaks about it in the, in the Gospel of Luke. And the Bible says in Hebrews that, that the time would fail us to give an, a detailed account of every act of faith by God's chosen vessels. Uh, but this woman, we read about her not only in the Old Testament, but then again in the New Testament, and her faith is so stunning and so profound and so important that God the Holy Spirit said, make sure you don't miss it in 1 Kings, but in case you do, I'll have Jesus repeat it to you in Luke. And, and, and you say, how did she do it? She did it God's way. Amen. It's, really that, it's really that simple. She gave first to God, and then she had enough left over for herself. And that is the divine order. Matthew 6 and verse 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. What are all these things? Well, go back in your own time and read Matthew 6. 
It's the day-to-day needs that we have. God, if Jesus said, you're worried about what you're going to wear. You're worried about this thing and that thing. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over. Shall men give into your bosom with the same measure that you meet. With all shall it be measured unto you. Uh, how, how did this widow woman give beyond her power for two years? She did it God's way. Took an extraordinary amount of faith. She gave to a wanted man that she didn't even know before she gave to her own child. Wow. What kind of faith will our faith promise cards reflect? What kind of faith will will my life reflect when God says, you go there, you go there, you go there, you go there? Will Will my life reflect that kind of faith? I, I, I see a profound sequel to the faith, and we're done. I see a profound sequel. I, I see the proving of the servant's faith. Sometimes God has to put us to the test just to remind us that he's faithful. The proof of the sovereign's faith, a person of stunning faith, a proper showing of faith, and then a profound sequel of faith. Verse 15 and 16. And she went and she did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and her house did eat many days. Two years. It's many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not. And I don't know how old her son was, but can you imagine if like, he was a teenager? They're like starving every other five minutes. <laughs> it's a true story. I've had four of them. And they did eat many days. And by the way, I don't think they ate just one meal. I think if they were hungry, they ate. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elisha, the profound sequel of her faith. What were the consequent blessings of her faith? Well, first of all, God's promise, all these things shall be added unto you, was true in her life. Given it shall be given, was true in her life. But really, that's the least of the stuff that happened. Because think about this. Before this woman is, is, meets Elijah and obeys God's word, she's resigned to die. But after she trusts God, he meets her needs many days. Maybe, maybe you're under the sound of my voice and you know you're going to die someday. You don't know where you'll spend eternity. I want to encourage you. God's word says that God can meet your need. But to as many as received him, Jesus, to them gave he power or authority to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And and, and the profits and the benefits were beyond that. Elijah survives, and he is sustained. And what happens because of that? Well, Elijah goes back, and he preaches in, 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 in Israel, and he challenges the prophets of Baal and Mount Carmel, and he wins a great victory, and there's revival that breaks out. And what's the, what's the consequence beyond that? Well, in this New Testament age, thousands of years later, we're still meeting together, talking about this widow woman's faith to be encouraged in our own faith. It's a profound sequel of faith. Her, her, her act of faith, her simple act of faith was far more reaching than she could have imagined, than, than Elisha could have imagined. And when you and I step out in faith, sometimes we don't have a clue what God's going to do. We don't have a clue. We don't understand it. Let me tell you about another not-so-stellar trip on our deputation. I'll wrap this up. Mostly they were good, honestly. Mostly they were good. 67 churches, by God's grace, to God's glory. I, had not, I was so stupid, I didn't know what I was doing. God felt sorry for me. 67 churches, you think you're going to do it? He said, okay, 62 of these will support you. That's how it worked. But that, God did that. I didn't do that. I'm telling you, I didn't even know how to do it. But there were five that didn't. I only remember two that weren't so stellar. And, and it ended up being good, right? The first one where they ended up taking us on for support anyways. The second one was when we flew to Belgium. <laughs> it's the only time ever I, I said to a pastor when I made a meeting, Pastor, if we come, do you think you might support us? Because Belgium's kind of far. 
And he said, listen, if you come to Belgium, we will support you. We will. I said, okay. We went to Belgium. And I'm just going to say it this way. You don't have to do anything. You've been so kind here. You've been so gracious. They could have learned some things from you in Belgium, okay? They were not so kind, not so gracious. In fact, they were rude. And they didn't support us. And Belgium was one of those things that I didn't like to talk about. <laughs> I didn't understand why we went to Belgium. And, and, and a couple of years after we went to Belgium, I was back in the United States and I was preaching a missions conference somewhere. And I've got a friend who's a missionary in Peru and, and he came and he saw me. He said, hey, Tony, how are you? I said, Lee, good to see you. And, and uh, he said, hey, Tony, I heard you were in Belgium a few years ago. I said, yeah, Lee, I don't like to talk about it. Let's not talk about it. And he said, yeah, no, but I heard you were there. I said, yeah, Lee, it wasn't a good trip. I got to preach in a few minutes trying to have a good attitude. Shut up. <laughs> He's like, no, but I heard you were there. And I, you know, I was like, Lee. <laughs> he goes, yeah, um, you preached there, didn't you? I said, yeah, it was just, just one night, though. I wasn't the keynote speaker. My, my director preached. I preached only one night. He said, yeah, I know. I said, how do you know? You weren't there. We didn't have internet in those days. He said, oh, I know. It was a military church, right? I said, yeah, it was a military church. He said, yeah, my cousin was there. Oh, okay. He said, yeah, you, that night you preached. He surrendered to missions. He surrendered to preach. He's, uh, he's preaching today. That was better than support. That was so much better than support. And wasn't God gracious to let me know why he sent me there? You know what? So sometimes he's going to do that and sometimes he doesn't. And I don't know where your there is. I don't know where your there is. I don't know where your there is on that faith promise card. I don't know where your there is in this, this world. Maybe it's right here in Pendleton, but maybe it's, maybe it's somewhere else. And I don't know where your there is. But can I tell you this? We serve a God that you can absolutely, positively take it to the bank, trust 100%. If God says this is your there, he'll be there too. And he'll meet you there. And he's already prepared. Songwriter said he's already in our tomorrows. He's already there prepared to meet you at your there. Where's your there? I don't know. Father, thank you. Thank you so much for this church. It's been so kind and gracious to us. They've listened so well all week. Now, God, as we do business with you once again, I pray that, Lord, we come to this point in the service that I think is probably the most important. We have now the opportunity to make decisions that truly have the, have the potential to impact eternity. Bless and what we do in these moments as pastor comes, in Jesus' name, amen. Let us stand together, heads bowed and eyes closed. The piano is playing. Uh, we're going to lead in a simple song of invitation. Some of the most important words in this simple course are these first three. I have decided. There is absolutely nothing in our lives that can possibly happen, that can possibly amount to anything without those first three words. And so this is a time of decision. It's a time of decision regarding what will we give to missions this year. It's a time of decision on how will I live my life? Will I live a life of faith? Will I trust in God? Will I trust in me? Do I even know if I'm saved? And the only way to salvation is there are three words. I have decided. It's a decision. It's, uh, salvation is not an application. Salvation is not a a work release program. It's a decision. It's a step in faith in reaching out to receive 
a gift that the Savior has offered you, to receive a gift of salvation, a gift of pardon, something that you cannot have unless you decide. Going to the mission field, I have decided. We're going to sing this song. You don't even need the words. You don't even need to look up. But as we sing this song, if God is speaking to you to come and make a decision for him, you come while we sing this song. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And with heads bowed and eyes still closed, sometimes we reason in our minds, if I do this, what will somebody else think? discovered in my life it's really never going to matter what anyone thinks except what God thinks and that is why it doesn't matter it doesn't matter what your I have decided is before the Lord and so it doesn't matter if anyone joins you or, or doesn't join you I think of all those missionaries who left and they went to where they went alone and it didn't matter what anyone thought. We're going to sing this second verse, though no one join me, still I will follow. Maybe this is your verse to come. Though no one join me, still I will follow. Though no one join me, still I will follow. With heads bowed and eyes closed, this third verse simply says this. It says, the world behind me. What does that mean? The world is the place you live. The world system is what the devil tries to use to tie you up and to tie you down. But you can leave things behind. The Samaritan woman, she left her water pot behind. She just tossed it over her shoulder. She just left it behind her. There was something more important to deal with. And sometimes we just need to leave something behind so that we can take up our cross, the plan that God has for us, and follow Him. Maybe this is your verse to come. Let's sing. The world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back. seated. It's important for you to understand what missions conferences are. Um, missions conferences are where the missionaries come and they preach to them and not to me. 
That's not the way it is. And the thing is, this week, I'll tell you what, I have been, I have been moved and tugged and stretched. And, and uh, it has been a great week. And, uh, and you know, I've, I'm, I've been all for Faith Promise Missions for decades now. But there's still some new things that the Lord taught me. First of all, let me ask you this. Is there anybody here, uh, this is a Faith Promise Commitment Card, and, and you don't have it, or it was your plan to have it tonight, and you left it at home, your dog ate it, it's on the floorboard of your car. Is there anybody and you need another one of these tonight? Anybody else need one? Uh, listen, anything and everything happens, okay? You have yours. Uh, you have mine. You are a witness. Pastor, what are you giving? I'm not telling you. But God knows. It's a promise I make to him. It is one of those promises that ever since I've done faith promise, I've never broken the promise at all. And um, many, many, many times it's been a step of faith. But I had to deal with the fact. I had to ask myself this year, is it something I can budget or is it faith? I had to really think about that because I really want it to be faith. And so, as you see, there's different ways to give. You can give weekly, you can give monthly, and so you can circle one of those. And you go, Pastor, what do you do with these? I look at them. I add them up. Um, and really, the reason I add it up is it's not to say, oh, look, how much are we giving for the year? No, it's so that you know, I can look ahead because missionaries are coming and they're calling. I have, I have a couple of missionaries and they're just kind of hanging out there in the phono sphere right now because I haven't called them back because I don't know what's happening yet. And so I've just kind of held them at bay. And I, let me tell you something, that's kind of like pit bulls. Missionaries do not like to be held at bay. And, um, but, but my bird, I'm just so greatly burdened for them and for this world. And um, I don't know how much time we have. Uh, this world is, can you imagine how a world can go from uh, kind of okay to a total mess and nothing flat? And uh, we thought COVID was a total mess and yay, we're out of COVID. Yay, we're almost in World War III. What a, a fun is that? <laughs> just like that, just turning on a dime. And so we don't, we don't have much time. And we need to be aware of that. And um, sometimes I'll, I'll hear somebody and they're, they're, they're so worried about their savings account or their investment account. And you know what's so funny? Sometimes people like that, I mean, they're in their 70s and their 80s. And, I go, and, and, and I've told some people this. Uh, they don't like it when I say I say, did anybody ever tell you that dead people don't spend money? I go, what do you saving it for and you know why not see God use it for something and so um, we're going to have we're going to have a time you can drop your cards in if you want to but we're also having a love offering and that is to help these people here uh, specifically uh, you know uh, brother Klein was here brother Kyo is here brother Matheny is here uh, brother Balava is here and, and this is to help them this love offering is specifically to help them. And, and I hope you'll be generous because as you look at the gas pump and say, wow, it's hard for me to get gas in my car, hard for them as well. And guess what? They're going to log more miles this week, uh, truck driver accepted, more miles uh, this week than, than most of you here. So let's have the men come forward. We're going to receive this offering. We're going to pray and we're going to ask God uh, to bless the offering and for God to show us what, what he wants to do here. Uh, Bob, I'm going to have you bless the offering tonight, please. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this mission conference and the tremendous messages that were heard this morning. And the different testimonies from the missionaries, Lord, I pray that uh, each of us will be touched by this in a way that will change our lives. 
changes and these changes um, in the way that we're making our giving uh, proactively to you as the teacher said tonight of course we must give and many of us as well as many kids we help us to do that and bless us as we go home tonight and keep us uh, until uh, the next meeting that we have together in Christ's name we pray amen <laughs>